think we'll, uh, we'll start now, if we can. Um, <clears throat> my name is, uh, is Tom Leonard. I'm the, uh, I'm the president of TPI, and uh, I would like to welcome you all here for our, uh, our seminar on, uh, on transatlantic perspectives on broadband policy, inter versus intra-platform uh, competition. And also to thank uh, our friends from CEPS, Center for European Policy Studies in Brussels, and particularly Andrea Renda for helping, uh, helping us to put this on. Um, we're doing this really because discussions about broadband policy um, increasingly have become uh, transatlantic and even global, I think as most, most of you know. And what happens in Brussels and other capitals around the world affects the policy environment in Washington and vice versa. And in fact, it's really, it's, it's really all become one, uh, one, large, one large discussion. And one illustration of this is the, is the OECD broadband penetration rankings, which uh, are widely quoted <clears throat> and have become part of the policy uh, discussion uh, despite their flaws. And, and uh, in this regard, I would, uh, I would commend to you a paper that's out outside on our um, uh, on the table there and also on our website by Scott Walston, our Vice President for Research and Senior Fellow. Um, Scott uh, dissects the OECD rankings in great, in great detail and shows why, uh, why they are, uh, are not a good basis for policy. And I should also at, at the same time uh, point out a, another paper by Scott, which is also out on, uh, outside on the table and is very germane to today's discussion, which is a, uh, a study of, um, of unbundling regulations across, uh, across OECD countries. Um, to start our discussion today, I want to, uh, I want to turn to uh, uh, Ambassador David Gross David probably probably needs uh, no introduction to an audience like this, but I, I will introduce him anyway. Uh, since 2001, he's been the U.S. Coordinator for International Communications and Information Policy. In that capacity, he's led more U.S. delegations to major international telecommunications conferences than anybody else uh, in history. Prior to, prior to being in the government, he was a partner uh, in the communications practice at Sutherland, Asbill, and Brennan and he was also the Washington Council for Air Touch. He has been a good friend of ours for many, many years. He is a, a tireless advocate uh, for U.S. Uh, interests and for good, good communications policies uh, and IT policies around the world. And I, I give you David Gross. Thank you, Tom. It's a great pleasure to be here. It's, uh, it's wonderful having uh, uh, an opportunity to talk about, about these issues. Uh, I was asked to uh, sort of say a few words uh, to start this morning off uh, before you delve into the details and the uh, academic wonder that is inter versus intra-platform competition, an area actually that, that does take up a lot of our time at the State Department and other parts of the U.S. government's time, both domestically, of course, and internationally. Uh, let me just begin by saying a few words about uh, what will be happening over the next couple of months uh, in terms of the international agenda as a way in which it may lay a bit of a, uh, a background for the d more academic discussions that you will be having uh, later this morning. Uh, as many, maybe all of you know, uh, next up on the international agenda in this area is next week's OECD Ministerial on the Future of the Internet Economy. Uh, this is the first OECD Ministerial on our subject matter in 10 years, since 1998. So the fact that it is the first one we've had in 10 years, and we'll talk in a moment a little bit about how the world has changed in those 10, 10 years, is itself quite significant. It's also, I think, very significant and something worth pondering that this is the first ever OECD ministerial held in Asia. And it is not, I think, it is not, I know, an accident that it is being held in Korea and that it is about our issues. And that should 
both be a signal of great pleasure and to some degree of some concern. Great pleasure, of course, because it shows that the issues that we're talking about back in 1998, which were, I think, to some reasonable observers, really issues that were primarily of interest to the United States and to Western Europe and a few other players, has really now become a global set of issues and one that is of particular and keen interest in Asia, where the governments there have clearly shown great, great uh, involvement and interest in these sorts of things. I have these uh, Blackberries that make phone calls randomly, and uh, I don't know if you all have the same problem I do, but usually when I begin a speech for some reason, it recognizes the fact that I'm speaking, even though as far as I know, it has no voice recognition technology built into it, uh, and immediately starts calling randomly various people, and I learned this uh, a little while back when I got home from giving a speech overseas, and my wife said, that was a terrific speech you gave. It was really something. And I went, I'm so glad that our friends told you about it. And they said, friends? What friends do you think you have? No, I heard your speech. And I got, uh, you know, no C-SPAN, no what, what's going on? And she said, no, I thought you thought it was going to be such an interesting speech. You just called me and let me listen to it. <laughs> and I would have thought after 30 years of marriage, she knows there are no such speeches uh, that are that interesting and so forth. And it was just my phone deciding randomly that it was worth calling her. The good news, it was her and not Vivian Redding at the time, because uh, it could easily have been anybody else. So I apologize. Every once in a while, I hear my pocket talking to me, and I realize that my phone has mysteriously turned itself on again. Anyhow, going back, however, to Asia and a little bit about the OECD ministerial. Uh, the ministerial next week, as many of you know, is really divided uh, into two parts. Uh, the first, which will be held a week from today, is really a, is not officially part of the ministerial itself, but it'll be a gathering of well more than a thousand. In fact, over the course of the three days, my understanding is we'll have something in the order of 1,500 to 2,000 participants. So it's a, quite a very large gathering with somewhere in the order of about 40 ministers. Uh, so again, a very substantial high level meeting. The first day, however, is going to be a day devoted to industry, NGOs, academics, and others, uh, talking about a wide variety of issues. Uh, I will be participating uh, in those sessions. Uh, Vivian Redding will be participating in those sessions. A number of ministers will also be participating, as well as, as I noted, uh, a substantial number of academics, industry participants, civil society, and the like. And then the next two days will be devoted in more classic form uh, to the OECD ministerial, uh, which is a nice way of saying that there will be a series of panels in which ministers will participate, uh, certain select uh, industry representatives, academics, and others will participate. And although it promises, as these things always do, promise to be a dialogue, they will, of course, be a series of incredibly fascinating speeches uh, that will, of course, require those of us who will be slightly jet-lagged to stay awake uh, and will be a test, uh, as they always are. But all kidding aside, it will be a very significant event. It is a significant event because of those who are being gathered there to have discussions. It is a very impressive cross-section. It will need not only the OEC ministers from the OECD countries, but many of the accession countries as well, and a good sprinkling of many others in addition. So it promises to be quite a diverse group in that area. And I think that brings me really to my second point. As we think about the changes in the world since 1998 to today, where we often, through our day-to-day -day focus, look at very narrow slices of very important issues, it is a good time in fact, really almost a perfect time to sit back, stand back, and think about what's happened in those 10 years as a way of helping us help understand where we think we'll be going in the future. And the first lesson I take out of looking back at the remarkable progress that the world has had since 1998 in this area, where back in 98 the focus was what could government do to help enable working with industry and others e-commerce. 
That's really, in many respects, although an important issue, really not a very interesting issue anymore. It's happened. It's going on. It's enormous. And what's really happened are really two things. One is that set of issues, that focus that we had in 98, has broadened in ways that no one could reasonably have anticipated over our short period of time, over the past 10 years, to envelop the entire world. Now, one might reasonably have speculated that it would have enveloped much of the developed world outside of North America and Western Europe, to include certain other countries. But when you think about how the issues that we're now discussing are of great economic and social and political importance to Africa, to South Asia, to the Middle East, areas that in 1998 had virtually no telecommunications connectivity at all, no less connections to the Internet. This quantum leap is something I think people are only now beginning to understand and to recognize its importance. And so the broadening of this has happened in a way that really was beyond any reasonable expectation. Which brings me to the second lesson, which for this crowd I think is a lesson that you understand well but is worth repeating, which is those who seek to predict the future are almost always invariably wrong. And in the area of which we are focused on, the area of telecommunications and the internet, usually wrong by many orders of magnitude. I began my practice in the area of telecommunications many, many years ago in the early 80s. And one of the areas that I started focusing on very early on was wireless, which is famous for its inability to project, even by its most optimistic proponents, a reasonable expectation about what the future would be like. It's always wrong, and it's always wrong dramatically on the conservative side. And so the lessons that you take from that is that the impact is likely to be very broad and much broader than people have thought about it before. It's likely to be very different in ways that are completely unanticipated because technology has a tendency to act in totally unanticipated ways. Governments are likely to react in ways that are not fully understood by those trying to project ahead. And of course, the economics continue to shift in ways that are very, very unpredictable. And so there's a great, great deal of humility that comes as you think ahead, which brings me perhaps to the point that I feel most strongly about as you have these discussions. And that is really what is the appropriate role of government? And really the appropriate role for government, I think, history has shown by its unpredictability of the way in which technology evolves and the way in which people are incredibly creative in using that new technology. And that is for government to enable, not to try to predict and to encourage one result versus another, but rather to enable that which will come and allow technologists to develop technology, entrepreneurs to create opportunities, and people to be able to take the services and buy the equipment that they're interested in having. That's easily said and very difficult to do because, as you will be discussing this morning, incumbency is often a huge impediment, a huge drag, we, by nature, as human beings, think about the future in ways that are rooted in the past. Sometimes that's good and wise, and sometimes that's very misguided and false. And so there are very important issues for all of us in how we look at these things, the role of government, the role of all the other players. And that will be the subject of discussions both at the OECD next week and there will be a declaration that will be unanimously affirmed, because they always are. Uh, and I think it's really quite a good one. 
It's a declaration that goes back to core principles. It's a, it's a document that will reaffirm in unequivocal ways the importance of free flow of information, which to me is what's in fact at the heart of all that you'll be discussing today and all that the industry has to offer. It will talk about enabling environments. It'll talk about the importance of intellectual property. It'll talk about the importance of all of these things for the future of mankind. Because that's really what this is about, serving people, being able to provide the types of opportunities for people, whether they're provided by government, industry, or others. That will be at the heart of all those discussions. But those discussions, of course, will really only be begun or be renewed at the OECD next week. We'll have an opportunity to have further discussions between the United States and the EU many times over the next couple of months. We have a formal US-EU dialogue, as we have every year. Uh, we'll have that in September uh, here in Washington. And we look forward to that. Uh, we, in addition, We'll continue to have a series of uh, discussions, dialogues, meetings with individual member states of the EU and others. I just came back about a week ago from having visited Finland and Estonia, among other countries, and had very good discussions about issues of great importance, including these issues that we're talking about here and cybersecurity and the like. So we'll have a very active and deep, as we always do, opportunity to exchange views and to try to influence each other's thinking. Our views, our thinking, will be, of course, at its heart, based upon the things that you're discussing and the important work that you all are doing by trying to illuminate these various issues with hard data, hard thinking, and a hard, realistic view about what really is best. And so I look forward to hearing more about the outcome of today's discussion. I look forward to having continued dialogue with you all. And perhaps uh, most importantly, look forward to continuing work with the Technology Policy Institute because its timing and its opportunities here are so superb. The issues are, of course, from my perspective, extraordinarily important domestically, but at their heart, they are truly global. And that is probably the most important lesson we've learned over the last 10 years. These are not issues in the United States. They're not issues of Europe. These are global issues. And the discussions and po policy formulations that come out are global policy formulations. And the rest of the world looks very, 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 very closely at the discussions, at the debates, and at the outcomes that are determined here in Washington, in Brussels, and in other major capitals around the world. And so I look forward to talking with you, learning from you, listening to you, and most importantly, working with you all in the years to come. Thank you very much. No net neutrality questions? God, that's, I get off easy. I'll ask the net neutrality. <laughs> <laughs> Don't take that as an invitation, Tom. <laughs> uh, just, just, just perusing very quickly the um, the uh, list of speakers for the uh, for the OECD ministerial in Seoul, right. uh, you see fairly prominently a couple of prominent academic proponents for Larry, Tim, people like that. For net neutrality. <laughs> Maybe they were. Maybe maybe I wasn't sensitive enough, but I didn't see anything on the on the other side. Is there? What should we? What, what should we read, if anything, into that, or how? Well, I, I don't really know uh, what to. I mean, seriously, I really don't know what to read into it or not. I think, um, you know, this is an OECD ministerial, so therefore we don't organize it. So this is not a question of sort of governments getting together and sort of parsing out one side versus the other and trying to, to do the sort of balance thing that we typically do. Uh, obviously, industry is very well represented at the OECD through BIAC and others. Uh, they would have to explain what their views on these things. That's really the way industry 
is represented. It's not through governments, of course. Um, and I really don't know sort of how people are picked and, and chosen. I know that the first day, which is not the sort of the non-OECD day, uh, well, non-ministerial day, technically, uh, which is sort of set, supposed to set the, the scene, I think was, in, uh, as it was explained, it's supposed to be very diverse. I don't know if it really has been. Uh, frankly, I don't, maybe this is heresy, uh, I'm not too worried about it, uh, largely because uh, we'll have Chairman Martin will be there. I, he'll be giving one of the opening day presentations. I would suspect that he may say a word or two about net neutrality. Um, of course, uh, you know, we've been quite outspoken in our views. We had Secretary uh, Gonzalez talk about it uh, just, uh, uh, just a couple days ago. Um, so we're well positioned. We are very careful in the declaration itself, which is sort of the big document, I think, to be careful in that area. Um, and, but also, of course, as is true for most of these types of meetings, it's, it's probably less about the speechifying, it's more about the discussions, the quiet discussions that are fostered by having all these people in one place at one time. And so, of course, I encourage, as I always do, everyone to be quite outspoken, uh, and particularly through, either through Q&A or just in terms of hall conversations and the like. But I think it's, um, if, I think the cause would be more sensitive if there was something inappropriate in the declaration or something tangible in that way, you know, who's speaking and who's not, I'm not sure that really is going to be uh, as important, although we always seek diversity of views from our perspective. Mike Nelson, Georgetown. Uh, on, on the Thursday, the day after the ministerial. After I'm out of town, right. After, after you're out of after, town, the OECD yeah, staff sorry. and the members of the Communications and Information Policy right. Committee are going to meet, and they're going to figure yes. out what the OECD should do for the next two or three years yes. based on what the ministers have said. Right. If you were writing the agenda for the OECD for the next two or three years, what two or three projects would you really hope to see in the agenda, and, and how could they influence national and international policy? Well, actually, you know, we're, we're still having some of those discussions. There's been a lot of work done, and we always welcome input, and it's not too late to have, uh, to have that input, because there will be a very robust discussion on Thursday. Dick Beard from my office will be leading our work in that area. Obviously, we'll have the Department of Commerce and others with us. Uh, so we're working very hard on that. You know, I think, uh, obviously, there's a whole bunch of different things um, that will be very important. Obviously, broadband writ large uh, will be an important piece of it. I think having flexibility will be important, uh, flexibility in the sense of the way in which people think about it. But also, you know, the OECD is a very special place. Um, and it's special in a number of respects, but one of which is it's you know, it has uh, a well-deserved reputation for being analytically strong and reasonably unbiased in its, in its views, and one can disagree about particular statements and so forth, and of course we have our fair share of disagreements, but that's par for the course, it seems to me. Uh, but I think the way we're thinking about it is, what is it that a organization like the OECD, with its core competencies, what is it we can have them do that would be different than that which we can do ourselves or that which other international organizations can do that would be really helpful in terms of advancing the policy dialogue? Uh, and obviously, its reputation internationally is very important. I mean, it's, it's not so much that we, the United States, domestically will change our views because of things, or many other major countries do. It's influence, but that's one piece of the recipe. The way in which I view it is really for the rest of the world as well. What sort of best global best practices, what is it that we can really bring that will be very, very helpful? And I think one of the other pieces to all these things is, you know, we look to all organizations now in terms of cybersecurity issues, uh, not because we want them to necessarily do something. Some organizations we do, some we don't. Uh, but rather to make sure that the importance of reliability and stability of the Internet, what is it that can be done? the importance of those issues. Um, I think it's becoming much more uh, globally recognized than it was before. Any more questions? If not, yeah, let's ask David again. Uh, thank you. Uh, I guess the, uh, we need the next panel to come up and
If you've got it on there, why don't you just give it to me? Anyway, you can kill the screen for half a sec. You want to kill the screen for half a sec? How do you do that? Let me just disconnect the thing. Oh. <laughs> That's one way to do it. F8. Oh, here it is. Uh, uh, okay. I'm it up to work anyway. <laughs> is it important to you? Hmm? Is it yeah, important? It's not that big. Uh, thanks for uh, putting up with our technological issues, which are always part of using PowerPoint. Um, so we'll start the panel today. Uh, I'm just going to give very brief introductions to all of our panelists, um, and I hope that uh, uh, you'll take the time to read um, read everyone's bios. So we really do have a, a very um, distinguished panel, and we're very grateful for everyone who could participate and everyone who could come. Um, also, uh, Ambassador Gross mentioned his issues with his BlackBerry. I should take this t opportunity to mention my issues with my BlackBerry, and that's that um, the trackball doesn't work, so I can't turn off my ringer, and the off button doesn't work, so I can't turn it off without taking out the battery, and it's, I don't have a watch. So if my phone rings, I'll try to turn it off quickly. Um, <laughs> everyone else should turn off their phones. Uh, so we'll, we're just going to go in alphabetical order here, and uh, our first speaker will be um, Ari Friedman, who is uh, currently Senior uh, Competition and Regulatory Counsel at British Telecom, uh, and also an adjunct faculty member at the uh, Wharton School. He's also chair of the Communications Industry Committee of the Antitrust Section of the American Bar Association, and I, I happen to know that um, he has, there's an outstanding paper on network economics that has been uh, overdue for a couple of months. Um, and that's uh, by, by me, uh, I haven't finished. So um, I, I, I'm very grateful that he would agree to participate even though I, I've been delinquent in delivering that. So that's good. Okay, well thank you. Go up there and use the uh, uh, chart, whatever you uh, First of all, I wanna give you a, a, some background on my perspective on this issue and then give a disclaimer. Uh, I am Senior Competition Counsel for BT Global Services. That is the international uh, arm of BT, serve BT uh, company. Uh, so we do business for enterprise customers worldwide. And so I have a perspective of uh, how we meet our customers' needs worldwide uh, rather than uh, in, in locally in, in, in England. Uh, in fact, many of you know we have a functional separation model uh, in the UK, and I'll address that a little bit as well. My disclaimer uh, is that uh, while I am here uh, talking about my experiences with BT, what I say are my own views and are not necessarily those of, of my company. Uh, okay, I, I, the picture is supposed to be looking across the transatlantic so you see uh, uh, the, the different perspectives. Uh, first of all, uh, I, I want to, um, I, I suppose my point here uh, from our experience at Global Services is that uh, the U.S., certainly compared to the U.K. and other countries that have adopted a more proportional or regulatory model towards what we see as a bottleneck access, uh, certainly in the enterprise space, which is the, the last mile, the access mile, uh, has in fact led in the U.S. to 
uh, to uh, lag in broadband deployment and investment uh, because of the premature deregulation of the market. Uh, and when we compare the U.S. and our experience in the U.K., we find that U.S. broadband speeds are on average lower than those in the U.K., uh, while prices are materially higher. And our perspective is that that's because uh, a, regu a proportional regulatory model has been adopted. But first I want to adopt uh, some definitions so we're all talking uh, in common terms. Uh, first is, what is a broadband? Uh, the FCC in the United States adopts this 200 kilobit um, and over measure. Uh, we think that is way over inclusive in terms of what we see going on both in the residential and certainly in the business market. Uh, in the residential market, our experience is that uh, the one megabit uh, really sort of is the bottom threshold of what uh, per second uh, ought to be uh, broadband and so in the, in the uh, enterprise space uh, even a higher measure. Uh, the other uh, distinction that we think needs to be made that I do not believe is made in analyses is that the residential market is very different uh, from the business market, uh, and that's for a number of reasons. Uh, one is uh, the residential market uh, has is served usually by a second line, which is the cable line. Uh, we find that alternative, when we have to service our customers in the United States uh, or elsewhere, uh, often is not an available line, either because it's not there or, more importantly, it's there. Uh, but the cable companies, uh, their primary market focus is on the residential market, is on video. They want to keep their space for video. Uh, they don't particularly want to run the business uh, services on there, uh, at least while they're competing very heavily in that space, the video space, uh, with the incumbent carrier. Uh, the second is the uh, need for connectivity. Uh, in, in, uh, Enterprise customers that we serve uh, want a single provider to be able to provide both in urban areas where there often are central business districts where often there is competitive alternatives, a uh, local competitive alternative, uh, but they also have to service data centers, uh, offices uh, that are in exurban, suburban, uh, or uh, rural areas where tax rates are lower, uh, employment rates are lower, uh, and they want a single provider to uh, provide that connectivity there. And obviously, the alt competitive alternatives when you have that kind of multi location requirement are different in the enterprise space than they are in the residential space. Uh, let me give you some experience in the UK. Uh, uh, in the Uni United Kingdom, uh, we have uh, over 99% uh, of the UK households are in ADSL-enabled exchanges, uh, and the ones that are not are those that are extremely rural in nature uh, with under two, around 200 customers or less. Uh, and that this uh, solution of what we're trying to do there uh, is, is developing as well. But you can see how we really have the area covered uh, very well. Uh, total UK penetration is currently 55%. Um, uh, we have, well, certainly on the, on the, um, in the retail area, uh, there are approximately 25 million UK households, of which 3 million have cable, and approximately 9.5 million have DSL. Uh, small and medium enterprises purchase another 1 million DSL lines. Um, as he, we have uh, cable provided broadband is available to 55% of the UK. Okay. Uh, speeds, uh, uh, almost 90% receive speeds at 3 uh, megabits or higher. And you can see the breakdown uh, of, of the average speed there. Uh, the average speed now in the UK is approximately uh, 4 megabits uh, per second. Uh, in th there we go. Um, it's a vibrantly competitive market, as you can see. There are many competitors there. In fact, uh, BT's share of the market is relatively small. Uh, we have 26% share of the market, or tw sorry, 24% of the residential market. Uh, Virgin Media, which provides mostly cable-based uh, broadband, has 26% of the customers. Uh, the other competitors have 50% of the broadband, and they use that primarily un through unbundled loops purchased from BT or by reselling various versions of BT's DSL services. Um. Okay, that, that just uh, indicated, in fact, we are now uh, uh, moving up to almost eight megabits uh, in the UK. Um, and those statistics of uh, how speeds have gone up uh, in the UK, and that's the, uh, the number of competitors we have in the United Kingdom. And our prices uh, have gone down, and in fact, are uh, about now 21, I think $19 on average uh, for uh, uh, broadband services. Uh, compared to the U.S., uh, on the other hand, uh, the number of, of, of cha non-incumbent challengers in the marketplace uh, has declined over time, uh, and um, the market share for the non-incumbent DSL has also declined over time. 
Uh, that's a comparison of the pricing uh, that was uh, in the U.S. compared to AT&T, Verizon, and uh, uh, their, their Fios alternative. Uh, and we think that, and in fact, uh, believe that the difference in all this uh, is due to uh, a difference in the regulatory uh, models. Um, we find that in the U.S. there are very few alternatives in the, res <laughs> in the residential area. Uh, it is cable. We don't find the wireless at this point a very critical uh, alternative. Uh, we also have uh, in the European environment, or in the U.K., more unbundled, uh, more bitstream access. Uh, we don't have this equivalent uh, distinction between information and telecom services where you've had forbearance uh, in the U.S. Uh, in terms of net neutrality, that really is not a debate in the U.K. because we have access competition. Uh, and so we can have discrimination, and it works in terms of how you discriminate in terms of price, not to really unlawful or invidious discrimination, uh, because customers have alternatives to where they can put their uh, content. Uh, in terms of productivity, uh, the U.S. productivity, the myth has been that the U.S. has been more productive because they have simply uh, and, and just drastically uh, deregulated the marketplace. In fact, most of the deregulation occurred when there were many uh, uh, CLECs out there when the government had regulated the, the sort of opening of the marketplace and that, in fact, productivity uh, and uh, innovation has declined uh, as uh, the number of at least market-driven innovation has declined uh, as the number of, of uh, competitive providers have entered the market. Um, <laughs> moving fast, I'm running out of time. Uh, but we find that uh, uh, in terms of market-driven regulation rather than uh, 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 monopoly-determined applications, uh, that uh, market innovation is, is better uh, advanced uh, through competitive entry. And an example would be fiber. Uh, we find in the UK that while fiber certainly is a, a positive thing, the marketplace right now uh, wants 8 to 10 megabit speed. Often the marketplace will support that with bonded copper fiber rather than having to use uh, copper cable rather than having to use fiber. Uh, and therefore, uh, the investment that you're seeing in the US it seems to be premature in terms of what the market uh, would demand uh, on many applications. Same thing with Ethernet. Our customers want Ethernet throughout uh, the world. In Europe and certainly in the UK, there's lots of Ethernet alternatives. In the U.S., it's a metro offer. Uh, we can't seem to uh, be able to obtain it in, in the rural areas uh, or the suburban or exurban areas where we need it. Uh, thank you very much. We'll, um, we'll go through uh, all the panelists' presentations and then do Q&A. Um, so next, uh, next up, thank you, Ari, that, uh, is Tom Hazlett, who is a uh, professor of law and economics and uh, director of the Information Economy Project at George Mason University. Um, he also uh, he writes a column for the Financial Times, and in 1991-92, he was chief economist at the FCC. Um, Tom. Okay, thanks, uh, uh, Scott, uh, very much for inviting me, and I congratulate all the uh, gentlemen who wore ties today. That's just great. <laughs> uh, maybe I haven't stepped outside yet, but uh, you will. You will. Okay. I'll get right to it. Uh, I, I have actually several hundred of the best broadband jokes in the world, but we don't have time. They'll give me 10 minutes. i got to get... Sorry. Yeah. Some people will say this is even funnier. Okay. Uh, basically, um, I think there are two uh, views of convergence. Uh, the U.S. view, uh, if you want to uh, be vulgar, uh, says that uh, we see convergence as a, a world in which multiple networks are expanding, invading each other's turf, and competing. The other view of the world is that uh, everything is getting so much more efficient that the new natural monopoly is emerging. And, of course, the policy implications are quite distinct. Uh, uh, the uh, A view uh, favors facilities-based competition, and the B view uh, favors uh, this natural monopoly uh, uh, subsidy slash regulation um, uh, type of um, uh, approach. Uh, I should say that under any scenario, there's still a lot of regulatory debate, so the lawyers can relax. Everything is okay. Um, I'd like to make two sets of observations about these two views. Um, I'd like to observe uh, and show some of the uh, observations I've been uh, looking at or uh, 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 trying to do a little economics on the last uh, 
period here with uh, the U.S. broadband race, and also look at the uh, global wireless data race, if you can call these races, but uh, you can make some comparisons between markets, between regulatory regimes, and hopefully say something about uh, the um, uh, optimal regulatory approach. So uh, I don't mean that the race is fixed. I mean that uh, I'm talking here about uh, fixed line broadband. <laughs> and um, uh, <laughs> we haven't had a fixed race since Saturday. <laughs> so <laughs> since uh, uh, so, so uh, I, in the U.S., we do have uh, two primary forms of uh, residential broadband, as you know, cable modems, uh, which has had generally an unregulated environment, and then DSL, which fortunately for economists everywhere uh, has been regulated and then deregulated. And so uh, we're, we're able to uh, find out something about the uh, so-called open access regime, uh, regulated uh, uh, unbundling of uh, the uh, DSL network. Uh, by examining uh, deployments, uh, uh, and uh, here I'll uh, focus on uh, subscriber growth patterns across these regimes, and if you're interested in the, uh, the paper uh, uh, that I'm going to be taking this from, you can certainly uh, uh, Google that uh, or go to my website at uh, George Mason University and, and, and uh, uh, get a copy and give it to your friends for Christmas. Okay, so uh, this uh, empirical observation it looks at the uh, performance of the marketplace uh, across different regulatory regimes. In the U.S., you can categorize the broadband regulatory situation uh, as essentially belonging to three categories. Uh, before the first quarter of 2003, cable modems were unregulated. They've been unregulated throughout. Uh, uh, on the other side, uh, telecommunications carriers providing uh, competing broadband through DSL. Uh, have been uh, up to first quarter of 2003 regulated uh, rather um, ambitiously with what was called a line sharing obligation to uh, offer uh, uh, low priced uh, access to uh, independent third party uh, broadband uh, providers uh, uh, essentially reusing the, uh, the telecommunications uh, carriers uh, facilities. Then in uh, uh, the first quarter uh, of 2003, the uh, federal regulators uh, essentially eliminated the line sharing rules but kept other regulatory obligations in place. Uh, that regime uh, lasted until the third quarter of 2005 when uh, further deregulation was taken and essentially cable modems and uh, telecom uh, carriers were put, on a, uh, uh, put into parity in a deregulated environment. So what happens? Well, uh, obviously the uh, pro-regulation hypothesis is that open access is going to improve deployment to the extent uh, that uh, third-party application providers and third-party uh, network providers are both going to have a higher degree of assurance that they can get access to facilities and that that form of competition is good for customers. Uh, given all the costs that uh, may be entailed, the benefits exceed them. So um, we certainly see in the first period, uh, up until uh, the end of 2002, that uh, cable was far more aggressive in investing and deploying and successfully attracting customers in residential markets than DSL. It was about a two-to-one lead that remains throughout that period. Then we have this uh, very interesting deregulation in the uh, beginning of uh, 2003. The prediction was made that uh, broadband costs would go up, particularly for DSL and that this would uh, hurt uh, 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 deployment of, uh, of broadband technologies. As you can see here from the difference between the actuals and the predicted, the predicted is the dotted line, predicted just based upon uh, existing uh, deployment trends uh, given subscriber growth, that in fact there is a sharp increase, a very sharp increase in DSL growth. Uh, there's a sm uh, smaller uh, positive uh, increase in cable modems. Uh, and, uh, in fact, if you take this out through the end of 2006, the DSL penetration rate is 65 percent above trend. This is about 10 million U.S. broadband subscribers. So there's a very healthy uptick right about the time of the uh, 2003 deregulation, eliminating line sharing. And, uh, in fact, if you uh, try to decompose that uptick, you can see a further uptick uh, from trend uh, also at the time of the 2005 third quarter deregulation, uh, much smaller um, uh, and, and uh, of course, much shorter in duration in terms of the uh, uh, 
uh, the time we have uh, to let that run. Now we can compare the U.S. market to the Canadian market where uh, the, the market structure is very similar but there was no regulatory switch of this nature to see if something's happening in international markets or with the technology that would really drive these kinds of changes, DSL versus cable modems. You don't see anything like that. But the, uh, the really the, uh, the very strong empirical conclusion is that deregulation was not a negative. In fact, it, uh, uh, it is uh, correlated in time with a very substantial uh, increase in deployment and the argument that investment incentives, uh, incentives not only to uh, deploy the network in terms of uh, sunk capital but also to market more aggressively and in a more coordinated fashion uh, without the certain uh, free rider problems in the marketing and so forth, that, that those arguments are uh, very consistent with these data. Uh, and so this is a very positive in the U.S. experience with the, uh, uh, with the A view of convergence. The convergence works and the regulation was not helpful. So investment incentives are real and important and open access regulation uh, on technology deployment in our experience in this instance was negative. Now we have two minutes for wireless. Um, there's, a, there's a controversy you may know about vertical integration by carriers and uh, lots of uh, uh, pro and con on this that it's efficient on the one side, it's anti-competitive on the other and uh, certainly there's an argument for regulation based upon uh, the anti-competitive foreclosure argument. Uh, there's some issues that uh, uh, obviously are uh, uh, untrue just on their logic that U.S. carriers would try to disable Wi-Fi because they don't uh, get the revenues. Well, if it's their phone, they can get the revenues. So uh, that's uh, not a good argument. But uh, there still is a foreclosure argument that can be tested against the evidence. And in current work that I'm doing with two other uh, authors, uh, a paper soon to be out, um, uh, you can actually look at uh, uh, countries, and this is uh, data from 1999 through 2003, quarterly data on the uh, 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 output or minutes of use in, uh, in wireless markets around the world, you can see which markets actually have unbundling regulation. There are five in our sample and um, uh, they are uh, randomly dispersed uh, in this uh, graphic which shows the relationship between uh, spectrum, the amount of spectrum in the market which is very positive for output uh, and the um, uh, and, and, the, uh, and the quantity of, uh, of minutes consumed in those markets. And in fact, if you look at uh, the, the competition in the market, obviously the more competition, the better. That's why you get a negative slope between concentration and uh, quantity of output. Uh, you, you, you actually, uh, when, you, when you sort through this statistically and adjust for all other factors, uh, you can actually find that there is a negative correlation uh, between the uh, output and the unbundling countries. Um, but the, 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 the more important thing is that there's no positive. The U.S., for example, has very high output, obviously, without uh, regulating the bundling of handsets uh, in the wireless network. And uh, the, 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 you don't have to believe my numbers, you don't have to believe the statistics, just believe the regulators in all these countries that outlawed handset bundling across all five regimes now, uh, we have seen regulators relent and in fact go very aggressively to reverse course to allow handset bundling for 3G. Okay, so this is the Finnish situation as uh, described in a paper recently issued there. Uh, the innovator's dilemma, which is spillover effects that are uh, very positive uh, from uh, new technology but are not captured individually by customers in, the, in a short term, that dilemma led to focusing on the possibilities of bundling. He's talking about the regulatory debate. Uh, the Finnish parliament allowed bundling, excluding second generation. So for third generation, where they had to get new deployments and, and new technology in the market, uh, that, uh, uh, that has been uh, proven a very successful. 3G has taken off because of bundling. There is clear cause and effect relationship between allowing bundling and 3G becoming popular in Finland. So uh, you, 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 go, um, uh, you go in that direction and you see something very positive. I'll just mention the last thing here. People were, were often... Uh, compared the United States to uh, all these great opportunities we see for uh, uh, open markets because they're better regulated in, in, in Europe and, and Japan. And uh, in most cases, uh, uh, the, uh, the illusion is not strongly supported by the evidence, even in terms of the regulatory regime uh, being all that different. I'm talking wireless now. But Japan uh, is, is known for its uh, so-called strong bundling and the fact that uh, there's a very important uh, and tightly vertically integrated structure of the uh, Japanese market 
and uh, uh, the handsets uh, uh, obviously bundled and, and uh, the, network, the, the, the operators, the carriers, have a very big impact on that. Well, you look around the world and you see that uh, the U.S., the unregulated U.S. market, uh, has not only the, the most voice minutes, but the Japanese market uh, has the most uh, 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 revenue coming in from data services and a very advanced data market, not, not due to high prices for the data, but actually due to high outputs. Um, I just uh, leave you with the last, is that the U.S. now is uh, hopefully joining uh, the Japanese success with wireless data just in the last uh, couple of years of reported data, which is now a year old from the FCC, we of course went from zero, approximately zero wireless broadband uh, subscribership in the U.S. to about 35 million. So that's in an unregulated environment where in fact bundling uh, contracts can take place and uh, uh, the deployment is coming very rapidly. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. Um, our, our next speaker is Andrea Arenda, who uh, is, is a senior research fellow at SEPS in Brussels. Uh, he's also coordinator of the European Network for Better Regulation and a professor of law and economics uh, in, in Rome. Uh, I, won't, I won't mangle the name of the university. Uh, and uh, Andrea has been a, uh, a, a good friend and partner to us um, in, in Brussels, and we're very grateful for his uh, participation here. Okay, so I don't have a PowerPoint presentation, so so, <laughs> so I think we now I can even close that. No? Can I? Okay. So first of all, let me thank uh, Tom Leonard and Scott and Carla McCoy and all the friends from the, the now turned Technology Policy Institute, which I think is a very good initiative. And our collaboration dates back to now two or three years. Uh, I've stayed at SEPS since then, so st still Center for European Policy Studies. And what we do is normally organize these events in order to compare what, what are the approaches on the two sides of the Atlantic. And uh, also some encouraging signs lately have been that there's more uh, signs of uh, transatlantic cooperation on a number of issues, including regulatory cooperation and the Transatlantic Economic Council that has been created lately. And our uh, Vice President in uh, the European Commission, Gunther Verhoegen, uh, has been quite ambitious in launching, well, in announcing the, the f one year after the creation of the Transatlantic Economic Council and the meeting that uh, was held two or three weeks ago in Brussels to celebrate that. So now, what are the results of this? And then I will turn back to telecoms and, uh, and what are the, the, the things that we can say about uh, approaches in telecommunications? Um, well, well, the results of the, of the TEC, Transatlantic Economic Council, this step. Maybe by the end of this year, we will have an, a joint agreement on poultry, and that's all. Huh? So uh, maybe Gunther Verhoegen said we should do something more on innovation policy and telecommunications, but they don't have a clue of how to do it. And maybe one of the reasons is that if we compare inter versus intra platform competition and uh, we compare the approaches on the two sides of the Atlantic, we realize that the approach has been very different. And uh, Probably also because the European Commission at the very beginning thought that there would be no contradiction, and they still think there is no contradiction between the two. So you can have short-term intra-platform competition in order to, to achieve one-day inter-platform competition. And this is the realization of what, uh, in, in Europe, we have termed uh, the ladder of investment, and in the U.S. was called once a stepping stones approach. So... Um, the difference between the two is that we keep pursuing that objective uh, of having enabling initially service-based competition uh, in the hope of one day uh, having new entrants gain uh, uh, size and, and one day also being able to invest in their own infrastructure. What has happened since then? We have a regulatory framework in place since 2000, uh, 2002, or 1st of January 2003. And uh, if you look at the data, of course, of course, we'll end up comparing the data, and uh, Scott has already done a very good job on this, and I, I wouldn't rely too much on o OECD data, and I agree with what you wrote, Scott, but uh, uh, let's, let's stick with those ones, uh, even if we, we compare those ones. We see that in the, in the 15 years between 1990 and 2005, uh, in European companies have consistently invested 38% less than European companies in, in telecoms infrastructure per capita. And, uh, of course, this doesn't all depend on the regulatory framework in place. 
Um, and of course, this doesn't apply to all countries. We have a presentation in the UK where the regulatory approach, and I'll come back to this in a second, was more consistent. And th then I'll explain why I think it was more consistent despite going towards this monster which we now term functional separation that is scaring everybody in Europe. But um, the, the figures also tell us, and the Commission also uh, realized that in a recent uh, 13th implementation report that was published in March this year by the European Commission, uh, that more than 80% of, of customers in Europe still rely on incumbents networks for access to broadband and to, and to narrowband. And this is something that, to some extent, uh, determines the failure of a policy that was uh, created in order to enable, over time, investments in alternative infrastructure. So we had the first phase, service-based competition, we never had the second phase. And the letter of investment proved very hard to implement in practice. And uh, another thing I must say is that once we migrate, or we are about to migrate, uh, many operators are about to migrate towards what we in Europe mostly call next generation networks or all IP networks. Uh, the problem is also that this investment ladder model to so the different rungs of the ladder, these different access points of the ladder where you can enable companies to, to gain size and customers for, for one day investing in their own infrastructure, changes completely. I mean, most of the access points become a moving target in, in, in an all IP network. And this is also something that would require careful revisiting. So what happens in terms of policy? The Commission has come out with a proposed review of the regulatory framework in order to update it. But unbelievably, uh, the Commission hasn't said anything about what would happen with the uh, all IP networks and whether there should still be a uh, regulatory framework that uh, fragments the market into formerly as many as 18 rel different relevant markets and now reduced to seven, but still uh, separating uh, fixed and mobile retail and wholesale in a way that uh, r national regulators would never be able to capture the, the features of the business models. Uh, so what did the Commission do? The Commission has tried to go towards what we could term a UK model. In Brussels we will never say that, but uh, it's like a UK model. Uh, try to include functional separation uh, of the incumbents network uh, as one of the potential remedies, probably the most uh, intrusive remedy, but it's one of the potential remedies that could be activated by national regulators. Well, I would, uh, I would, you know, I would like to uh, answer questions in this uh, developments because I don't have much time now to uh, go into the way in which the Commission had introduced functional separation in the framework. But what I can announce as of now is that the current debate taking place in the European Parliament has gone in the opposite direction. So the Parliament, uh, although there's no final vote yet, is repealing functional separation in the list of remedies. What, are, what is the debate behind this? Uh, exactly intra, intra versus inter-platform competition. So nobody doubts, or well, some do actually, but uh, the majority of scholars also in Europe do not uh, cast any doubt on the fact that functional separation was very useful in the UK. And, um, but the doubts are over whether in other countries, especially those who have some cable, uh, but those who don't have very good regulators, like Ofcom is in the UK as well, will be able to uh, pursue such a strategy so successfully. And some also express concerns that invest investment in alternative infrastructure hasn't been that great in the UK. But still, uh, the, the most important uh, doubt that is being expressed is, uh, is the following. Uh, with a functional separation, we risk creating a, first of all, everlasting monopoly. Secondly, a uh, very badly managed system, which is still uh, very, very highly administered. And thirdly, uh, we risk uh, well, no, that we never roll back regulation. I mean, and the European regulatory framework was meant one day in 2002 when it was introduced to uh, be introduced and then be rolled back once markets would become significantly competitive. So what is happening, the Parliament is thinking about, and I will leave you with this, because this is what I think is, is, is the next scenario, not even the present one, but maybe in July will come out. What I've seen in the last statements in the European, from European Parliament uh, representatives is that um, maybe uh, Europe should not go towards regulatory holidays, and that was sure. I mean, nobody ever uh, uh, thought it, it would be possible in Europe, uh, if not Deutsche Telekom, probably. Um, Europe will not go towards functional separation as a main model, but there has to be some way of aligning the incentives of incumbents and new entrants in a rollout of new infrastructures. 
So what I've seen in those documents was still confidential, so I couldn't bring them with, with me here, uh, is ideas such as risk sharing arrangements between new entrants and incumbents, initial risk sharing, ex ante risk sharing, something that is very close to what we scholars would, would term real options models, uh, meaning that uh, some uh, access permits somehow are, are sold at the very beginning before deploying the network by the incumbent, and the new entrants buy them at a, at a certain price, uh, and from that point on, they have the same interest in deploying the best possible infrastructure together with the incumbent. This is not exactly functional separation, but it leads us towards intra-platform competition even more. Uh, there will be one single platform and, try and, and new entrants will, align, will have their incentives aligned with the incumbent. Of course, those who don't like the access price, the option price is that is offered, uh, can still invest in their own infrastructure. But this is something that I think 99% will happen, and at least will appear in, the, in the, uh, comments from the parliament during the co-decision procedure in a few weeks from now. So uh, at the same time, we're talking about duct sharing uh, and geographical segmentation, which are things that are totally absent in the current proposal from the European Commission. What I think is still missing at European level, and I think uh, it could be reached, uh, uh, and it's been uh, uh, reached several times in the US debate, but also in the UK debate, is a business model approach. And um, well, something that I could add to what you said uh, is that during the uh, functional separation process, or this first the strategic review of telecommunications in the UK, uh, not only what would happen at the infrastructure layer, but also what would happen in higher layers what is, was discussed in the UK. And as of today, the only regulator in Europe that has expressed an opinion on net neutrality is Ofcom, because in a consultation document at the end of 2006, I think, they uh, have expressed their opinion that full net neutrality, especially under functional separation, would uh, somehow undermine incentives to invest. Um, of course, I don't have the time to dig down into the, uh, this as well. It's just a helicopter view of what's going on in, in, in Europe, and of course, necessarily incomplete. But I think that um, uh, this is a good thing to, uh, to learn from the UK experience, that, um, what, well, deciding what, what should happen, whether there should be network sharing or not at the infrastructure level, has an enormous impact on what should be the regulatory treatment at higher layers. And this is what we call layered approach and, of course, business model approach as well. I'll, I'll be happy to uh, reply to all your questions on this. Thanks. Um, and uh, now we have uh, Marvin Sirbu, who is a professor of engineering public policy and industrial administration uh, and electrical and computer engineering at Carnegie Mellon, founder of Carnegie Mellon's Information Networking Institute. Uh, and uh, from 2006 to 2007, he was on sabbatical in Paris, uh, and so should have a, another interesting perspective. He's also a fellow Mac user, um, and we'll see if this.
So I'm actually going to ask a few questions. Um, well, uh, for servos, that's okay. Is um, is, uh, is is rebooting here? Um, so I wanted to ask um, Ari. Um, usually, when um, usually the critique of of this of uh, of, 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 the, of the deregulatory model in the U.S. Um, is that it has not fostered competition, um, which usually implies that there has been underinvestment. Um, but 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 you state that um, there perhaps has been too much investment in the U.S. That uh, the market isn't ready for fiber, um, for example, implying that Verizon, with its FiOS, is doing something possibly irrational. Um, but what is the what is the sort of underlying theory under which um, the deregulation has generated? Too much investment. Could you could you explain that further? I think it's not so much too much to rate, uh, the in investment as as subsidized investment. If you look at uh, FiOS and the economics of FiOS from our perspective, uh, the number of people taking up the service can't fund uh, the investment in FiOS, and so something else has to fund it. And what we're finding funding it is uh, well, we the monopoly we find is in special access, particularly in the higher speeds and in rural areas, uh, and we find that special access fees. Uh, are way above uh, the cost uh, of providing special access. And, and it's those funds, and there was a study done by ETI, uh, an economic uh, uh, firm that was submitted in the special access proceeding, which indicated that the, the, the monopoly rents that were obtained on the special access was funding the files. And of course, it's, it's the wholesale customers like, like new entrants like, like uh, BT, which have no alternative but to buy those uh, special access lines um, and so it distorts investment. So what we do is we're paying, overpaying for, for the special access rates in order to subsidize um, uh, fiber that, is, that the market is not yet ready to pick up and enough to compensate for the cost of the fiber. I mean, if, even, if, if, uh, even if there are excess profits on um, special access, why would they use it to, cross -subs to subsidize fiber? Why not just do something else with those profits? I, I, the answer, I, I don't know, other than the fact that it's a politically popular uh, investment to make. But it's an investment that's directed, uh, whatever it is, by, in the monopoly sense, is, is directed by the monopolists rather than by what we think the market demands or requires. On the other hand, there's underinvestment in other uh, services that we do need, such as Ethernet, uh, and Ethernet at, at, at a reasonable rate. I mean, most of our customers prefer, uh, Ethernet can be gotten at, at slower speeds, such as 10 megabits things like that, that we can't obtain in the U.S. We have to buy a T1, which is a much larger mm -hmm. pipe than we need, and so we have to overpay and overinvest in capacity that is not necessary for the customer's needs. So there's underinvestment in other services, uh, whereas when we go in Europe, uh, in certain markets that are, are where there is competition, uh, we have more alternatives. Now, there are other markets where there is not competition. We face the same problem uh, as we do uh, uh, in the U.S. Okay, well, this will be a good debate. Um, so we're almost I think there. we're... So, <laughs> sorry for the delay here. Um, so I'm going to just try and uh, briefly talk about what I learned uh, on my uh, sabbatical uh, in France on a by com trying to compare uh, broadband policy in, in the U.S. and France, and this can be obviously very quick uh, since we don't have much time. Um, so I want to look at uh, the broadband markets. Uh, I want to talk about ladder of investment and then say a little bit about next generation fiber networks. So if we look at... Um, broadband in the U.S. and in France. There are comparable uh, levels of penetration uh, in France, uh, slightly more uh, uh, connections per 100 inhabitants. Uh, this is uh, OECD data. Uh, if you look at uh, Scott's uh, data on household penetration, it's somewhat higher in the U.S. Uh, uh, the OECD data on price per advertised megabit per second, however, is substantially different, uh, showing a much lower price in France uh, uh, for service. Uh, and indeed, there's a much greater penetration of triple play service in France. So for $45 a month, you can get uh, not just uh, internet service, uh, which is a typical price for internet service in the US, but internet, IP television, and voice, uh, including unlimited long distance uh, in France and to uh, a number of other countries. Um, 
Cable is a major player in the U.S., but France, the market is largely based on DSL. There is a cable operator, but it has only 7% of the market. Uh, and, all, and we've moved to essentially a duopoly market in the U.S. Uh, versus a competitive market in France. Uh, when I say it's a duopoly market, if we take the FCC statistics uh, and we look at the uh, incumbent cable operator share at 43%, uh, no, sorry, 53%, uh, the incumbent local exchange carrier share at 43% and 4% and for essentially all the other players uh, in the market. Uh, uh, by contrast, the French broadband market, uh, the incumbent has only a 46% share. There are two other major players with, a, with a roughly a 20% share. Uh, the Iliad, which offers a service under the name Free, and Neuf Segetel, uh, with Neus, uh, the cable operator, having about a 5% share and about 9% split among a number of other smaller players. So what accounts for this difference? Well, the U.S., is, uh, as we heard uh, from uh, uh, Thomas, uh, has adopted a model which presumes viable facilities-based competition. We've had weak enforcement of, of a local loop unbundling, no requirement for wholesale bitstream access. Uh, for example, just last month, AT&T raised its price for wholesale bitstream access by 40 percent, obviously not regulated, um, and there's no requirement for line sharing. Uh, by contrast, in France, they have aggressively enforced local loop unbundling. The operators, uh, incumbent operators, are obliged to provide wholesale bitstream access. Line sharing is enforced. Uh, now, one should mention that the French loop plant is much newer than loop plant in the U.S., and that helps to uh, make it easier to support unbundling. Uh, there's uh, fewer uh, remote uh, terminals. Um, and a much higher percentage of the population lives in MDUs, and that has an implication as we look at uh, next generation networks, which I'll talk about in a second. Um, so if we look then at uh, the French market by technology, we see that um, incumbents DSL lines are, are 46%. Uh, uh, this is full loop unbundling, uh, line sharing, and bitstream access. So these services, which uh, these uh, mechanisms, which are uh, essentially uh, deprecated in the U.S., are very important uh, to uh, competition in France. Um, and the ladder of investment theory, which is we've already had reference to, is basically the idea that uh, with wholesale bitstream access, it takes relatively little investment to become an ISP. But once you have uh, got a customer base, then you can afford to invest in the infrastructure uh, to put in your own DSLAM for, uh, based on local loop unbundling. Uh, that allows you to lower the payments you're making to the operator. Also allows you to uh, invest in innovative technology. And indeed, in France, a Free was the first uh, op operator to invest in ADSL 2+, uh, even ahead of the incumbent. Uh, and finally, that with increasing market share uh, based on logical loop unbundling, uh, you can afford to invest in your own loop uh, in order to um, uh, get yourself off of making any payments to the incumbent. And we see now in Paris that there are uh, four different operators investing in fiber to the home in, in competition. Uh, uh, Free and Neuf Segetel uh, uh, and Neus uh, all have sufficient uh, market share uh, to be able to afford to make the kinds of uh, uh, billion euro capital investments necessary for fiber. Um, for next generation networks, uh, the U.S. policy is no requirement to unbundle uh, fiber to the home or even fiber to the curb if it's within 500 feet. Uh, we have um, have had for years mandatory uh, pole attachment rights. So if a would-be competitor uh, can get access to the pole infrastructure for stringing uh, his wires. Uh, in Europe, it's much more likely that the infrastructure will be buried. So it's access to ducts, which is the important issue, uh, something which uh, we don't mandate to the same extent here. Um, and uh, US has recently um, said that carriers may not oblige building owners to sign exclusive contracts. In France, the comparable rules are that uh, incumbent is obliged to lease space in ducts or conduits to competitors. Uh, they are not obliged to unbundle loops, similar to the US. Uh, but there is mandatory sharing of any in-building fiber that is installed by the carrier. Uh, and this is to prevent the, uh, the, the disruption that would happen if each of the four competitors building in Paris had to run their own vertical risers in every apartment building. Uh, there's some debate now whether the DMARC for that should be in the basement of the building or at the, uh, at the curb or essentially the branch point from the conduit, um, and that's still uh, uh, being discussed by the regulator. 
Um, and finally, proposed legislation in France would mandate in-building fiber to be installed in all new multiple dwelling units. Um, finally, with respect to municipal networks, several states in the U.S. outlaw municipal networks entirely. Uh, other states require a wholesale retail split, uh, and some cities and some states are, are allowed to offer vertically integrated services, such as in Bristol, Virginia, where the uh, municipality actually is the provider of telephone and video services. In France, uh, a policy was laid out in 2004, uh, which uh, essentially implements a wholesale retail split. Actually, it's a three-level model with the municipality may own the fiber, then they then contract with a third party to light the fiber, and that third party then provides wholesale services to competing uh, retailers, uh, much as the model in Amsterdam, uh, which is also building municipal network where the city uh, owns the passive uh, optical fiber, uh, a, a player is uh, lighting the fiber, and then there will be multiple service providers over it. Um, uh, this is somewhat constrained by EU policy. So our conclusion is that France currently has a more competitive market with lower prices to consumers. Uh, it has enforced infrastructure sharing rules which have been abandoned in the U.S. Uh, loop unbundling allowed innovative offerings from competitors to the ILEC, such as ADSL2, and at least with respect to uh, current investments in fiber, the ladder of investment theory appears to be working in France. Thank you. Thank you. Before we, before we take questions, I'd, I'd like to continue asking a, a few of my own. Um, and I'd like this, this question is um, sort of both to, uh, to Andrea and to, uh, and to Marvin. Um, and, and part of this question is sort of some of it's my interpretation of what's going on, so please feel free to correct anything that I say that's, that's, uh, that you think is just wrong, um, but not too loudly. You know? uh, so I, I, it, it seems to be, it's my, my impression that um, in more of the recent uh, in, in more of the recent statements from regulators, uh, and obviously I haven't seen any of the, anything that's confidential, there's been less sort of talk of the ladder of investment and more talk of um, sort of infrastructure sharing almost as an, an end in itself a little bit with this, you know, question of risk sharing arrangements um, uh, and, you know, what I've read of, 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 of regulators trying to figure out how to get the operators to share costs. Um, and then, so that's, that's kind of to uh, Andrea, I guess, to talk a little bit more about this and whether I've, I've kind of got that wrong. Um, and, and to Marvin, the question of, um, of the ladder of investment here, uh, you said that now that these, um, these companies like Free that have been using uh, France Telecom's network uh, have a sufficient base for investment and for building out their own fiber, um, it's my sense that we've been hearing that since 2006, but there's almost nobody in France has fiber yet. Um, and, and so, I mean, tell me if I'm wrong, but they're still reporting almost zero connections. Um, uh, so the, uh, it, it is certainly uh, rolling out uh, relatively slowly. Um, the biggest problem in France is getting the um, individual building um, uh, condominium association to agree to uh, the disruption associated with pulling the fiber risers in the building. And this has to be negotiated building by building. It's uh, sort of the same problem when uh, level three tries to get building access uh, in this country. It's sort of one building at a time. And that's a very slow process. Um, but uh, I think the interesting point is that it, France Telecom is no farther ahead in this than Free or Nocetetel. Um, and so the problem is affecting all of the players. Well, I think you're right. So first of all, so no problem with the <laughs> with correction of, any, of anything. And uh, I think you're right. The uh, infrastructure sharing has uh, been gaining momentum uh, in a discussion lately. What I wanted to point out is that the commission hasn't said anything about infrastructure sharing. The commission has uh, uh, presented a proposal in November last year uh, by uh, confirming the overall approach, and in, uh, including in not in the in the new. Uh, proposed directive, but in explanatory statements and in a stock working papers, proposing again the ladder of investment model without clarifying how this would be applied in an mm -hmm. NGN environment. Uh, it has been uh, probably um, it, it was the, the top five incumbents, I think, with a paper that was delivered to the European Parliament that have uh, moved the, the uh, uh, attention from uh, ladder of investment to infrastructure sharing. Currently, the debate of it's over which infrastructures should be shared. So all utilities 
uh, uh, conduits should should be should be shared. Uh, ducts should be shared. Uh, whether uh, uh, sewers can be used and then shared, uh, if one uh, passes through sewers like uh, Iliad is doing fr in France, still, uh, I mean, what is what is missing is the the idea of risk risk sharing arrangements because uh, mm -hmm. well, these are things that still need to be built yet. And uh, whereas, and this of course applies to the to the access network much more than to the core because in the core many operators are migrating to fiber, but uh, it's still right. uh, uncertain what happens with the other if, if others will have an incentive to invest themselves. With a, with the, um, the the questions about duct sharing, is is the analogy in the U.S. just uh, rights of way in general, or yeah, more or less. Uh -huh. But uh, here it also uh, requires the yeah because well, well, I think I think the analogy is the pole attachment rules. Oh, uh, okay. Since we're largely uh -huh. aerial in the U.S., yeah. uh, whereas okay. in, in Europe it's more buried. Of course, it's uh, yeah physically it's not it's not the same, but right. uh, uh -huh. it's the same same role to play. Yeah, more or less. Um, do any of you want to respond to anything anybody else has said before we go to the audience? Tom, perhaps? <laughs> <laughs> Usually it doesn't take well, too much I to get going. Well, I might just, just <laughs> say, say something. Um, yeah, I, there's, there's a you know, fairly uh, regular pattern by this point in time about this debate in the U.S. and uh, our perspective on things versus uh, some others. and, and uh, uh, one of the things we do is we uh, religiously look at these rankings that come out uh, to see where we are on the on the chart, and um, uh, that, that is one way to keep track. There are many others. In fact, the rankings themselves, if you look, there's a broad cross section. Um, the OECD uh, has no monopoly power. I'll assert that just on their behalf. But uh, some some in the debate think that the OECD numbers are uh, somehow better than others. But there are, there are a lot of rankings, and they. They conflict. But one of the things that uh, does not uh, conflict is that if you go back uh, five and ten years, that, that uh, uh, the, the regulatory solution that's put forward now as some sort of an advance in terms of network sharing uh, could not be in effect, was not in effect, and the countries that are now claiming, like France, the UK, and so forth, or Japan, uh, that they, they've equaled the U.S. or their past, they all talk about their rapid growth. Well, the other side of the rapid growth is that, that those countries were a basket case in the early days of broadband. They had none. It was quite, quite a problem. Now, you can certainly sell the current regime of network sharing as uh, a fix for that. You know, we've, you know, we fell behind, now we got it right. You can also look at it as an industrial policy uh, that, that has to, to catch up, has, you know, relies on uh, a great de uh, degree of government planning uh, to figure out what the technology is, where, where to essentially subsidize uh, the technologies uh, by regulatory protection, implicitly or, imp uh, explicitly, uh, implicitly or explicitly. And so, uh, yes, you can, you can force feed a lot of uh, fiber uh, in a regulatory structure once the regulators get behind that. You've seen that in Japan, you've seen it in other countries. Uh, but you have, you always have that question of for the next leg in the, in the, uh, in the race, if we uh, use that flawed analogy, uh, that you're going to have a problem shifting to what's, to what's good. Now, the French, of course, tried, tried Minitel. And um, uh, I don't know what, you know, your, you know, your take on that. Isn't it, I mean, there may, may be an argument that that was a, a good try and, in fact, some social value came out of that. But... Um, Lots of industrial policies in this area have not been uh, terribly successful. And um, the UK structural separation is now, uh, to hear the regulators talk about it, a terrible constraint uh, on the ability to get more fiber out in the UK. It, it, it helped for one leg of that battle, and it's hurt to get to the next step. And um, uh, the, you know, one of the great advantages of competitive markets uh, uh, is that uh, you have uh, decentralized decision making, a lot of experimentation, and no barrier to the next technology being deployed if somebody wants to uh, step out there and try it. So I think that there's a lot more dynamism uh, in that in that context that is important. It helped the U.S. Uh, develop these markets early. Other other folks saw what was happening here and in, in Korea, which quite frankly was not a planned economy, did not rely on network sharing uh, in the unbundling sense. It's been applied elsewhere and became a world leader when people saw that those technologies were working, that broadband uh, was important and for real. Yes, there was a lot of catch-up, and that's, that's what you're seeing. But that does not 
uh, end the debate. That should, in fact, be a, be a starter to look at the whole uh, period here and to integrate over the entire period to see where the actual uh, value is being created and therefore looking forward where it's going to be created in the next generation. Um, Ari, I, I think Tom just said that uh, BT, uh, that functional separation has been a disaster. Um, and uh, and his, I think he was saying that, Ofcom was saying that. So <laughs> uh, uh, That's not the case. First of all, I, I just want to clarify, it's not structural separation, it is functional separation. And the distinction is important because the effort, at least, and again, we, we were the target of this regulatory relief, so it's not that we're the major proponent for it, we were the victim of it. But uh, uh, just to understand, it, it, it tries to maintain some of the vertical efficiencies. Uh, so it is not structurally separated. There's a functional separation, but still kept within the same company. Uh, secondly, uh, BT is rolling out its new generation network, 21CN, and making a major investment despite this regulatory overlay, or maybe because of the regulatory overlay. Uh, and in fact, uh, our investment is now based on uh, the demands of the higher level services. So people who are buying from our functionally separated unit called OpenReach, uh, they demand uh, certain services and certain product. BT uh, Global Services demands certain uh, services that we want from OpenReach, uh, that drives the investment. So it is market-driven investment that this functionally separated unit uh, is doing, and, and they're investing, say, billions of dollars in this new generation network. Um, uh, there was another point I was going to make, but it eludes me for the moment. But uh, we, we, while, while there are certainly an offcom, there have been issues in uh, uh, the investment. Oh, I, I know what the third point is. Uh, it, it nevertheless is a healthy, vibrant market that's driven uh, by uh, market demand and by the services level of competing providers. Uh, in the U.S., the, see, the alternative is not functional separation, regulation versus competition. What we're finding in the U.S. Uh, is that, in fact, the competition is drying up. And what you're, you're, what's emerging uh, is a highly concentrated telecom industry. That may be a good thing or a bad thing, but in terms of intramodal competition, that is between telecom providers, we are finding less and less competition, uh, and as a result, higher prices. Uh, intermodal competition is highly touted, uh, but in fact is not very uh, uh, present, certainly not in the enterprise marketplace. Our enterprise customers acquire 99% reliability, or 99.99, 59% reliability. Uh, wireless alternatives are not there yet. Uh, cable companies and the cable guys from a typical movie, but very few businesses are going to put their uh, master company, not going to give its, its uh, credit card business to a uh, cable company that can't guarantee it five nines of reliability and security. Uh, so we find a highly concentrated market. So the alternative for us is se functional separation versus the alternative, not competitive market dynamic market, but rather a monopolized market with uh, excessive uh, rates way above cost that with no discipline on that, and in fact uh, providing services that the monopolist wants to provide, not necessarily that the market demands. Um, let's take some questions. Tom. Uh, one, one of the, the underlying um, debates that seems to be going on here, and it, it, I, it, I'm not clear what what the resolution of it is. Is uh, is what is the effect of various uh, uh, network sharing, unbundling, and similar types of regimes on on investment? And there seem to be conflicting claims uh, across the panel. So I wonder if if uh, anybody would want to uh, address what really what really does the empirical evidence show about the effects of various network uh, sharing arrangements on on investment, particularly particularly at the wholesale level. Sure, just go down. Um, I think that it, it's a very difficult uh, uh, problem to uh, disentangle uh, the regulatory regime from all of the other contemporaneous factors. So, for example, uh, we saw a presentation that suggested that. Uh, the uh, demise of line sharing uh, led to a burst of investment in DSL, uh, but that same time period corresponds to the um, overwhelming uh, 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 growth and dominance of DSL in the world market, which meant that learning curve economies on the cost of DSL equipment based on worldwide deployments uh, were going to dramatically reduce the cost of DSL compared to cable, which was uh, on a worldwide basis, uh, not nearly uh, uh, producing a, a, the same volume of equipment. Um, so, it, it, 
and for uh, other institutional reasons, standards were developed earlier for cable modems than they were for DSL um, because they were done you know, within the U.S. only by cable labs versus having to be done in the ITU on an international basis for DSL. Um, so the result is that um, uh, it's very difficult to disentangle all of the contemporaneous factors. Uh, I've seen studies, for example, that showed that uh, during the period of uh, rigorous enforcement of local loop unbundling, that the levels of investment in telecommunications equipment uh, 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 cross-sectionally across COs and states uh, was much higher in proportion to the rigor, to the degree of rigor of the enforcement of uh, unbundling, uh, which suggested that it was the unbundling which was driving investment. Um, so uh, it's very, very difficult to get um, uh, an accurate read on this. And just a quick note on this, because uh, I, of course I would agree that it's very difficult to, to draw some conclusions on this, because uh, it depends a lot on the, on the remaining also uh, uh, features of the regulatory uh, environment, besides other you know, more macroeconomic variables and things like this. But, but what I've seen lately is a set of consistent uh, pieces of literature that have argued for the contrary, actually, that, that access policy has a negative impact on investment in alternative infrastructure. Not only Scott, to some extent, but also uh, um, uh, Len Waverman from LECG and, and others, but also Lars Ender Groller uh, had a paper last year. Uh, and uh, there were some, uh, not a couple of papers, I think, that came out that were showing this. And um, certainly, uh, this has to be uh, explained better. I mean, uh, in some countries, for example, countries like, like the UK, can still look at which kind of investment you're looking at. I mean, and it doesn't matter, uh, well, probably it's, it's not important to look only at investment in infrastructure, but also looking uh, at investment in other layers and how much competition flourishes, for example, in applications and services. And the UK exa example is one of them. Um, in order to add also to what, what you said before, I think that BT also, to some, I, I, I wouldn't say negotiated, but I, I mean, discussed to some extent what would happen afterwards when the, you were sitting down and discussing about functional separation. Uh, one example, to what extent you will be able to do bundling of services and applications, uh, something that echoed at least outside during the negotiations on functional separation. So there was some attention to what would be the regulatory environment afterwards at all layers. And I think a regulatory certainty drives investment as much as bundling versus unbundling. And uh, one of the virtues of the UK model, which I wouldn't consider to be replicable in any other European country, is the fact that uh, some degree, some good degree of regulatory certainty, legal certainty was achieved. Yeah, well, uh, obviously a lot of economists have, have, have looked at this, and I think that there, there is good evidence that uh, um, uh, on average the um, the regulatory policy that seeks to, you know, rearrange the property rights of the investors uh, is a very dangerous policy with respect to investment. And, uh, you know, you can make an argument that there's going to be a, a shift up in the, um, we call it the stepping stone in the, in, in the U.S. and uh, ladder of investment, I think, in, in Europe, uh, that there's going to be this uh, uh, successful uh, jump to, uh, uh, to inspire new investment. But, uh, uh, there, there are a lot of things that can go wrong in the U.S. Clearly, the stepping stone did not work, did not materialize, and there was this deregulation provided by the courts. And uh, you saw a positive response, particularly in voice markets after that happened, where, where now um, uh, about 90 percent of U.S. households can get fixed line uh, service from a competing cable operator. They didn't extend that network um, functionality uh, in, in any impressive way until uh, 2004 when the uh, network sharing, uh, the unbundling rules in the U.S. were, were thrown out. Uh, voice over Internet uh, technology was, was maturing all through this period, but there was a, a distinct jump right at that time. Um, with regards to what Marvin had said about uh, the uh, DSL market, yes, we tested for that. I went over this quickly. Uh, we wanted to see if there was some international uh, change in the relationship uh, between uh, cable modem service and uh, DSL. That's why we explicitly put into our uh, empirical test uh, the explanation that maybe uh, DSL was just getting uh, better uh, as a competitor to, to cable, and we use the uh, fortuitous situation that um, uh, we have to, to the north of us uh, where some very nice people have put together a smaller version of the U.S. just so we can test our theories <laughs> there. 
And uh, at any rate, the Canadian uh, broadband uh, market uh, residential is very similar to the U.S. in terms of uh, it being a uh, race primarily between cable and, and uh, DSL, and obviously the technologies available uh, to, to either are uh, purchased in the international equipment and technology markets. So at any rate, with using the Canadian uh, growth rates uh, as an explanatory uh, variable, uh, you still get a very significant kick up in DSL in the U.S. Um, uh, with deregulation at that time. Um, again, empirical research does not prove uh, causality. Shows you the correlations. The correlation goes in exactly the right direction, however, and does not reject the hypothesis that uh, deregulation uh, helps investment, helps deployment. Uh, it's not just investment in, in fixed or sunk assets um, that, that go into the ground or go on the telephone poles. It's also uh, the marketing and the uh, uh, promotion uh, of the new service uh, that's, that's very important. Um, there are also some, some markets we just never hear much about because, uh, uh, well, I don't know why we don't hear more about the German cable TV market. Uh, that, that's a, a classic disaster, and I will say that is a disaster. I did not say that uh, uh, UK broadband, this, this, is, this is, I mean, we're hearing a lot about how, how much we're getting. Uh, I don't know what the fiber numbers are. What's the fiber subscriber numbers in, in the UK? You got them? I, I know you, but I'm <laughs> Okay. So we, we, talk, we talk about a lot what's on the drawing board here. Um, we're not seeing large uh, fiber subscriber numbers. Um, but um, uh, the... Um, German cable market is regulated with, with uh, uh, structural separation across four layers of output to, uh, to make sure there's not too much market power through vertical control exercised. There's also a lot of horizontal uh, restriction placed upon how large those operators can get. The net effect of all this is that the German market is highly cabled. Uh, cable has been a popular service there for some, uh, for some time, and it is uh, virtually zero in the broadband market. It just hasn't been able to integrate into broadband. Now, what a waste of a network. And that is uh, almost surely caused by the vertical restrictions placed uh, by, um, I would say, the same regulatory uh, theory that um, you're going to get more competition uh, if you allow uh, the government to figure out which, which slices uh, need each other and which slices don't. So um, the uh, uh, you know, the, 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 the argument is very clear in the context of vertical separation there that you've, you've discouraged uh, upgrades and investment in network fun functionality. And I would just add, I'm going to repeat a lot of the points here, um, but I think we also need a common definition both of uh, the relevant markets and what constitutes broadband. I think a lot of studies become over-inclusive or under-inclusive depending on how they define the critical terms. Uh, and even the time frame that they think is the relevant time frame to look for. So I think if there's some analysis, and I've, I've seen studies showing the U.S. lagging, not just OECD, uh, some other uh, uh, reports uh, that indicate that the uh, U.S. telecom sector is lagging uh, a U.S. GDP growth generally. There are studies, but according, it, it studies different things, it studies different uh, uh, pools of data, uh, and I think probably needs some uniformity of data to get some consistent results. Um, I want to just add one thing um, on the, the definition of broadband. Uh, I, I'm, I'm sort of less hung up on the definition of broadband than many other people seem to be, but uh, it, if it's an issue, then it's an issue around the world because the OEC defines it as 256 kilobits per second. We define it as 200. Um, so it's not, that doesn't seem to be a particular U.S. issue. Um, I think it's more important to sort of know the, you know, the variety of speeds uh, available. But um, Ari also has been bringing up another point um, that other people, that, that we haven't talked about explicitly so much, which is the enterprise market versus the residential market. Um, and we don't have, especially in the, well, I don't think anywhere, we don't have good data on, on the enterprise market. In the U.S., we're counting, it, you know, almost all, all of the FCC count is residential, almost all of the OECD count is residential. In some other countries, the OECD is capturing some of the business market, about 30% of the OECD count in France is business lines, but th that doesn't mean they can separate them easily. Um, what, what do we know about that market? You've given us some information about BT's experience here. Uh, do we have any other information about um, the, the regulatory effect on, on enterprise markets uh, in the U.S. or elsewhere? Does anybody want to speak to that or suggestions on what to do about uh, the lack of data? <laughs> I'd like to make a comment, but there's no data. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think 
the part of the challenge is that the business market is a much more highly differentiated market. I mean, it's not just uh, uh, a basic one or two megabit service. There are services from one megabit up to uh, one gigabit uh, that are offered in the business market and uh, uh, services with 99.9% um, uh, .9 uh, reliability and services with five nines reliability. And a service with five nines reliability is a very different animal, uh, as uh, I'm, I'm sure our friend from BT knows uh, from having tried to deploy them. Uh, and so, uh, any attempt to uh, begin to characterize the market has to face up to the fact that uh, you're going to have to collect a lot of statistics on a lot of different products. Okay. Actually, there's, there's, there's a tendency to dismiss the enterprise market because of what's called countervailing market power. Uh, but there, somebody needs to study whether that's in fact reality or whether telecom service, first of all, the, the large enterprise customers really have no alternatives other than putting in their own fiber with all the high barriers to entry there is to that, and to what extent they're willing to leverage or can leverage their business power in other markets uh, to cut down prices uh, uh, when there are, there's one incumbent or two incumbents in a particular country uh, who had, can provide the services and nobody else comes to the table when an RFP is issued. So, you know, there, there are a lot of myths out there about the enterprise market to the extent it's looked at at all. Uh, and I think it's, 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 it tends to be dismissed without looking at data simply by saying, well, they're big, they can take care of themselves. Um, but I'm not sure that that's a, that, that myth is, in or that, that claim is, in fact, substantiated with any data. We have a question. Uh, yeah. I guess I'll stand up. I'm Linda Moore with Congressional Research Service, and I'm the analyst for uh, Spectrum Policy Wireless Technology. And uh, you didn't talk too much about wireless broadband. I want to say, by the way, I'm trying to create a finish, a brilliant paper <laughs> on spectrum policy and net neutrality. And I have also discovered that we are very weak on our analysis of the enterprise market and its effect on our regulatory and competitive policies as re refers to spectrum. Could anybody comment on how you see spectrum policy has shaped the development of wireless broadband going forward? And in particular, you, you mentioned, Mr. Friedman, um, the fact that wireless is not reliable for business because uh, at this moment is a, a wireless last mile. I think you said that. And I don't understand why because, for example, for the D block, which is our spectrum uh, issue of the, of the moment, the uh, cost of hardening a, a network for public safety is put at an additional six billion, and there's the argument that nobody wants to invest that extra six billion. And I don't understand it because I would think that that would then make a, mark, uh, a network that would be satisfactory for the enterprise market. So that's the general tenor of my question. Thank you. Um, let me uh, uh, take a crack at it. Um, First, I think um, th obviously the spectrum area is the one area where we actually decide how many competitors they're going to be when we decide how many licenses we're going to allocate or how much spectrum any one company can acquire. Uh, and with the exception of the uh, uh, license by rule markets, which we sometimes uh, refer to as the unlicensed market, um, where uh, the number of competitors is determined by the marketplace, and so you have in the Wi-Fi hotspot business literally hundreds uh, of competitors. Um, the, uh, the license market, uh, we, we rigorously determine how many players there will be. Um, I, I do want to make one comment going forward, though, about wireless uh, broadband as providing a competitive alternative to, uh, to wireline, because uh, uh, a lot of U.S. policy is based on the premise that, well, yeah, we have a duopoly now, but we're going to make it possible for wireless to become the third or fourth or fifth competitor, and so we'll end up with a much more uh, rigorous facilities-based competitive market. Uh, the problem is, is A, we don't allocate enough spectrum for wireless to provide high speeds and high throughput to a large number of people. Um, and uh, number two, as we move to higher and higher speeds, uh, one way you uh, achieve this is by uh, making the cells smaller. And when you start looking at the problem of, if I have 100 megabit wireless, how am I going to backhaul the traffic from the cell site? You suddenly realize that you need a very dense fiber optic network to reach all of the potential cell sites that you want to have in order to have this high-speed wireless network. 
And so uh, building out a, um, a high density fiber network is still a requirement even to have wireless. In fact, it, when you read the reports in the press about what's holding up Sprint's WiMAX network, the, the problem seems to be getting adequate backhaul. Um, and so uh, it should not be seen as though wireless is a complete substitute for fiber. It requires fiber. Um, yeah. Yeah, I agree also with what you just said. And uh, uh, well, I can take the European approach, although we're normally lagging behind on that, so it would be pro probably useless for you. But uh, yeah, there's been the idea that, that hey, the future is mobile. Everybody says that in, in Brussels. The future is mobile, also because in fixed we're not doing that well. So I mean, at least let's try with, with mobile. But still, when we get to spectrum allocations, what we find out that there are so many obstacles to freeing up the spectrum, especially in what we call a digital dividend in Europe. So what is currently happening is that the Commission has made a proposal to free up at least two-thirds of the, of the UHF band, uh, especially the upper UHF band, to, to allocate it to uh, um, wireless broadband uh, inter alia uh, technologies. And um, uh, what has happened is that, uh, of course, the Parliament is probably uh, challenging this view uh, because uh, broadcasters are normally more powerful lobbyists in the Parliament. So uh, there's been a huge fight and a huge debate. Finally, what I can say, the, the final result would probably be that uh, there will be a requirement in the new, regu new uh, text of the framework uh, to free up part of the digital dividend for uh, uh, wireless broadband. Once this is achieved, of course, we have a first step towards building, uh, you know, securing that there's a business case for wireless broadbands and their business models can, can actually thrive. But um, still, uh, I see many technical problems which haven't been solved. So uh, um, one of these is, is, uh, is a problem of securing adequate backhaul, uh, certainly cell size. And, uh, and the fact that uh, license allocation is uh, still surrounded by a rather obscure set of uh, technical <laughs> considerations and uh, we economists still haven't provided en enough guidance probably on how to uh, efficiently allocate spectrum through an auction. So uh, what I see here is that probably the future is mobile, but we don't see how far is this future. <laughs> and I would just clarify my statement by saying there is reliability and that there are perceptions of reliability. And what we enterprise customers need who require 5.9 reliability is they need to have the perception that they will get 5.9 uh, reliability. They probably can at some point with wireless just in the near term. I'm not sure that that's at a substitute in their perception uh, for secure uh, fiber cable. Yeah, uh, I, uh, I don't know if it came through in, in time, but I, I did touch on wireless. I spent four and a half seconds on it, and I, but that was eight slides. Um, the, um, uh, you know, it, it is interesting. I certainly agree uh, with Marvin. We have not um, made enough spectrum available uh, to carriers in the marketplace to uh, uh, provide um, uh, as much uh, bandwidth and as much competition as, as would be desirable. But uh, it is not true that we uh, have to assign the number of uh, competitors, and in fact we don't assign the number of competitors through, through, the, through the number of licenses that are, that are issued. The United States, uh, uh, Germany, many other countries allow the market to uh, uh, aggregate or disaggregate to some degree. And so you end up with something that actually uh, should be, should, we should go farther in terms of, of liberalization and, and allow this to be a much more fluid market, but it should be that the market uh, uh, in, with licensed spectrum uh, iterates on, on uh, competitive and efficient solutions. Obviously there are trade-offs between uh, deconcentration and concentration uh, because there are significant economies of scale with respect to the bandwidth holdings of, of a single carrier. But uh, the U.S. market, and people overlook this, the U.S. Uh, wireless market has been uh, highly successful relative to other markets around the world based upon quantity of output and price permitted of use. Uh, and now emerging wireless broadband is going very well. And the United States has done this with one hand tied behind its back. We have way under allocated spectrum, uh, not just absolutely, but relative to, say, European countries. And um, this is uh, a political problem, if not a debacle. 
Uh, yet, uh, the liberalization of the licenses we have issued, which took place essentially between 1988 and 1994, uh, that has allowed the spectrum that has been um, uh, uh, under the control of the carriers to be used very intensively. And that's why we have 35 million broadband customers in the United States as of June 2007, wireless broadband, uh, without any 3G licenses being in the marketplace. Uh, those are all on, on what the Europeans would call 1G and 2G licenses, where it's illegal to provide wireless broadband. So liberalization has been extremely helpful in substituting for spectrum in the U.S., and that has made us, uh, in fact, on the forefront of uh, international developments in wireless broadband. That should not be forgotten. On the other hand, we should not rest on that laurel uh, because we have just way under-allocated, and the, and the fact is over the last two years, yes, we have had some more auctions for some more bandwidth, and that about catches us up to where France, Germany, and the UK are uh, in terms of total allocated spectrum under the control of the carriers, but uh, we should move forward aggressively, and um, the current, uh, the current uh, huge mistake in this area is uh, certainly the television band, where we're, we're currently now subsidizing uh, through federal funds the uh, continuation and protection of the killer application of 1952 <laughs> uh, over the air broadcast television. And uh, to take federal money so, so that Aunt Minnie uh, can continue to watch over the air digital television um, is almost like you're writing a comedy script for this uh, industrial policy. Uh, what, what that 294 megahertz of so-called digital TV spectrum uh, ought to be used for is something that people actually want to buy and, uh, and, and has some social value to it when, when, in fact, we can deliver all those video signals through alternative media, including cable, satellite, and uh, Internet broadband. And uh, that, ought to, that ought to be allowed. It ought, it ought to be... Uh, a, a very smooth market transition. We've done it before with overlay licenses that allow actual owners of bandwidth to reallocate, and, and they do. And if, if you look at what happens actually in, in the liberalized uh, spectrum markets, which, which are controlled by the carriers, and see how much reallocation of spectrum goes on, uh, you know, for, where a Virgin Mobile can have all kinds of services and all kinds of this stuff, all these competitors you count as competitors in France, even though they're using somebody else's facilities, that's Virgin Mobile, or, you know, that's, that's uh, uh, TrackPhone and, uh, or Jitterbug. And you, you have these uh, so-called MVNOs, uh, the, 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 the virtual operators, come in and reallocate spectrum. And, and people have asked me before from Silicon Valley, so what's the great killer application, you know, of, um, of this great uh, deregulated market? Well, the easy answer that... Uh, even Silicon Valley loves is, is BlackBerry, because they've always got Blackberries in their pockets when they ask me this question, as though the wireless markets have not come up with anything. But, but BlackBerry is a wonderful example of how a market can work. Uh, Research in Motion has no wireless assets. It has no infrastructure. All it has is the ability to contract with wireless carriers in the U.S. and around the world because of the liberalization in the cellular market that, that has extended the in essence, the property rights of the carriers way beyond what, what broadcast television uh, licensees have. And, and you've allocated spectrum uh, to a service internationally now uh, that has no spectrum allocation behind it. So it's, it's, I, I disagree with the idea that the market is fixed in terms of competitors simply by the licensing policy. If you liberalize, you're going to get a lot of this very innovative technology into the market through innovative business systems and business models, and that's what we've seen. Well, one, one also in the distinction between enterprise and uh, it's not exactly right to call it residential since uh, businesses use the, you know, the Blackberries, for example. But there is, I mean, there's an entirely different uh, part of the wireless industry, which is sort of a equipment to equipment data transfers. Um, and there are companies that buy wholesale spectrum from the, the license holders. Uh, and then sort of and then sell it to companies that need uh, that have equipment that needs to send signals to other equipment and they won't use wireless I mean sorry they won't use unlicensed because it's they say it's not reliable enough and so they rely solely on this license spectrum that they that they buy wholesale and that sort of equipment to equipment sector of the market is not one that we ever talk about in policy circles um, but it but it's another example of this um, well I'm trying to be uh, neutral here but uh, anyway sorry um, Marvin you were going to uh, anybody else want to? 
I think we have time for, well, one, one more question, if, uh, if there is one. Yeah. Um, You're basically um, the second PT representative in, in uh, the last two weeks who, to me, in an amazing openness, stated that uh, you're not yet going for fiber, um, which, as a former business planner, I personally have a lot of um, understanding for. I think uh, the market may not be ready, at least at, at some, in some European markets. However, as a, as a lobbyist and, and regulatory guy, this is pretty much the exact opposite what any politician in the world that I know wants to hear from, from, from us, from carriers. You know, they all want us out there heavily investing in fiber, investing in the future, bringing our country to the top of the OECD or, or any ranking. So my question to you be, could you elaborate a little bit on what are really the plans for next generation and fiber in the UK and how BT, or should I say OpenReach, is, is going to decide on, on that, on those? Well, one of the benefits of functional separation is I have no idea what OpenReach is doing. Uh, all I can tell you is the difference, I, I suppose, is we do whatever the marketplace wants from us. I mean, whatever, whatever they demand in terms of the, of the type of capacity they want, how, and I don't think they care how it's delivered as long as they get a certain amount of, of capacity. And we provide it with what we think is the low, lowest cost alternative that we can provide with the facilities that are in place. Uh, I don't really have any more insights than that other than if our client wants 10 megabits of data provided from a certain circuit, we provide it with whatever is the least cost alternative uh, that's out there and, and invest uh, to that extent. Uh, beyond that, I, I really don't have any insights into what OpenReach's uh, uh, investment strategy is other than they meet our demands and, and we're just another customer. Uh, BT Global Services is just one of any other customers with the uh, equivalence of inputs requirements. But we're in line with everybody else. So what exactly is the difference between structural and functional separation if you are just like anybody else? I, it only, as far as I understand, it, the, we didn't spin off uh, um, the unit, but it does have a separate board that is majority control. I mean, the board uh, that handles their decisions uh, is it has majority of non-BT uh, members in there. The incentives of the uh, employees there are driven by OpenReach's performance and not by BT's performance. But we didn't actually separate the facilities and go through the process you did in the U.S. when we broke up the uh, the bells. And then we'll take the, yeah. there are two questions. So we'll take your question, then one back there, and then we'll be done with this. I, I thought some of the most useful discussion I've heard this morning was about regulatory uncertainty. And I, I think uh, Andrea and Marvin also both did a very nice job of, of indicating that you, know, you can have one mediocre, consistent policy that everyone understands, and that actually can be better than three different really good policies that change every two years. If you look at uh, what's going on in Europe, one country that I, I've always looked to is Denmark. It's a small country, but they kind of got their act together. They got everyone around the table. They created a consistent regulatory environment, and they moved pretty quickly. You could look at Korea. I mean, I don't know that they have the best policy, but at least they have a policy, and people have worked that and made things happen. I'm going to Seoul next week, and I'm going to learn a little more about what happened there. Do you have any lessons to learn from, from, from Denmark, anything in particular in Korea? And how would you advise President McCain or President Obama to kind of decrease the incredible amount of regulatory uncertainty that we've had in this country over the last 10 years? Okay, before we answer, let's take the last question and then answer them. Christina Speck from NTIA at the Commerce Department, also headed to Seoul at the end of the week. Um, just wanted to ask a question, actually it's a very specific question, um, to Mr. Friedman and then anybody else on the panel. Earlier in your remarks, uh, when you were at the podium, you said that uh, because of the structural separation and the open reach model in the UK, that net neutrality is not an issue there. Um, could you clarify that and does everybody else on the panel share that view? Thank you. Um, let's, start, let's start with Mike's. On regulatory uncertainty. Can we learn anything from Denmark and Korea? Yeah, I, I can uh, 
make some comments. One of the most interesting things uh, for me about Denmark, and they've, they've been very aggressive in rolling out fiber, uh, it's been done by uh, municipal electric utilities. Uh, it's not unlike what we've seen in the state of Washington, where Grant County Municipal Electric Utility was the one of the first in the country to roll out fiber. And, uh, and indeed, there's something like 400 municipal electric utilities in the U.S. that are investing in telecommunications. Uh, Jackson Energy in Tennessee and uh, Bristol, uh, uh, Virginia, also was a municipal electric utility. Um, so I think that uh, rules that make it um, uh, that, that remove barriers to munici uh, municipal electric utilities investing in fiber is probably a good thing. Um, and we've made it much too difficult, I think, in, in the U.S. and in a number of states um, for ideological reasons. Um, so that's, that's my comment about, about Denmark. Um, the issue of regulatory uncertainty, I think it's uh, highly related to our Anglo-Saxon system of, uh, of uh, checks and balances, uh, and uh, we make decisions very differently than France that has this long heritage of central planning, for example, and uh, all of the uh, bureaucrats went to the same universities. Um, I just don't think it would, uh, we could ever reproduce uh, in the U.S. the kinds of decision-making processes that you see in some of these other countries. Um, I'll also take a crack at the, uh, the issue about um, network neutrality. And uh, the issue is, I think, that uh, if an ISP be, begins to behave uh, in a non-neutral way in, in France, then it's easy for the subscriber to go find another ISP who might have a different policy. And there's lots of them because it's a, a competitive environment and not a duopoly. And the problem in the U.S. is that uh, there's probably 20% of the population that can only get service from a cable operator. And, uh, and in the parts of the country where you can get service from both cable and DSL, that's it. So if both of them decide to uh, behave in a non-neutral fashion, you're out of luck. Um, I wanted to add one thing about electric utilities. Uh, in Japan, about a quarter of the fiber market, I believe, is held by electric utilities. I don't know whether they're municipal or, or private, but to be truly non-ideological about it, um, the question is, you know, what bars electric utilities, period, from getting into the market, whether they're investor-owned or municipal? Okay. Um, there, and so... Uh, there have been legal barriers to the investor-owned utilities investing in telecommunications. That, that's an issue, too. Uh, yeah. Some of which were relaxed uh, over the last decade, but aren't there's still barriers. Okay, just a quick comment on, on Denmark first. Uh, of course, it's a very small country. Uh, it must be taken into account. It's very easy. It's up to 4 million inhabitants. Uh, it's very easy to roll out fiber there. And, of course, <laughs> uh, I, I, most of you will have read this communication from the, uh, from the European Commission in March by claiming that eight European member states are ahead of the U.S. in terms of uh, broadband penetration. Uh, well, my, my reply to this would be that also U.S. has states. Huh? I mean, it's not, I mean, let's say, you know, uh, 35 U.S. states are ahead of the EU in broadband penetration. Yes, okay, but uh, we need to look at the at geography, and, and that's important. And Denmark, of course, has uh, made a fortune out of de deviating partially from the, the uh, uh, regulatory framework in Europe, because they have hated from the very beginning the, the investment ladder approach. Uh, TDC, in particular, that, that has claimed that several times, but also the regulator has proven to be independent enough to, to uh, move away from it. And uh, of course, being uh, a limited number of players, or a powerful one like the uh, uh, electricity uh, producer, and uh, being a number of players at the table has helped a lot regulatory certainty. So I'm moving to this as well. I think that systems like um, providing ex ante impact assessments and uh, a wide consultation on the principles of regulation has helped a lot, especially in the UK. And this is something that is uh, increasingly being present at European level, European Union level, uh, not a lot in uh, uh, the behavior of national regulators. And what I've seen in Europe is the way in which the regulatory framework has been conceived initially didn't put regulators uh, in front of a, of a real uh, need to motivate their, their decisions when they, have, when they regulate. Because if they follow the path that has been predetermined by the European Commission, they don't need to prove anything, basically. There's no burden of proof that there needs to be a regulation in a specific field. 
Uh, when I see the uh, consultation, checks and balances developing, exempt and exposed assessments of the effect effects of regulation, uh, I see increasingly regulatory certainty, uh, not on the single provisions, but on the overall approach that will be taken by the regulator. This, I think, is a, is a lesson to be learned uh, by some European countries and to, to, to some extent also what happens in the US. Uh, finally, BT and net neutrality, I'm sure that, uh, uh, well, I already mentioned to some extent the fact that there has been some uh, 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 reference to net neutrality in the UK field. What was this uh, reference in the, in the Ofcom consultation document uh, for Christina who asked the question? Uh, basically, the idea that uh, you, you will discuss net neutrality when it comes to preserving the business case for deploying uh, next generation networks. And it is clear that, of course, if you have a functional separation, no control over, over the infrastructure, uh, in order to recoup sufficient revenues, you would need to uh, somehow discriminate or to manage your own network in a way that will help you uh, get some revenues. Otherwise, if you bring your, own, your customers to the internet and then they use Skype, then you're gone, basically. I mean, of course, it's oversimplifying. But. And uh, so that what Ofcom was saying is that, especially when we have functional separation and uh, the infrastructure la layer doesn't guarantee any, any return on the, on the initial investments or on the fact that one launches a, a multiplay offer, for example, then uh, uh, full net neutrality will probably leave players with no possibility of, rec of recovering their, their uh, of recovering enough revenues, and uh, this will probably lead the market to slow down. So, to some extent, net neutrality sh should be seen as functional to the idea of customizing one's own network, not by blocking applications, but by building a network that is closest to the extent possible to the customers one wants to serve. And uh, this is more or less the approach, but of course you, you can clarify that be better, the approach that I've seen uh, being taken from Ofcom, and that's also why I think it was worth mentioning that no other European regulator has, has tackled the issue so far. Yeah, we're going to have to um, let Ari respond, um, if you'd like, since it was directed at him. Andrea did a fine job. Okay, good, because otherwise we're going to have to take up a collection at the door um, to pay for the fees we're going over. Um, I apologize for it sometimes changing from a uh, neutral moderator to panelist, um, but I, uh, I hope you'll join me in, in thanking the panelists for a very interesting discussion, and thank you all very much for, for coming. Well, that's the functional separation, my friend. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> thank you very much.